Hello and welcome to Policy Watch, your pack snapshot of the week's biggest business stories, their context, their relevance and policy impact. I'm Govind Raj Raj. India's consumer price inflation or retail inflation has risen for the fifth consecutive month to 5.6% in December from 5.41% in the previous month. On the other hand, the index of industrial production or IIP is down by 3.2%. Now, these numbers have surprised many, particularly given that industrial production has now hit a four-year low. This also raises the larger question on whether the economy is more fragile than we perhaps expected. Moreover, what do these numbers really tell us about what lies beneath and more importantly, what lies ahead? And what should the response be? To discuss that, I'm joined by Shubhada Rao, Chief Economist at Yes Bank and Anjali Verma, Economist at Philip Capital. Thank you both for joining me. Shubhada, let me begin with you. So the numbers are of course odd and somewhat intriguing to start with and of course to many of concern. What is your own reaction? I think at the outset, Govind, uh, it needs to be pointed out that we have to look at these two numbers of October and November in mm. conjunction mm -hmm. because the festive month mm. typically sees a ramp up mm. uh, in the production levels mm. and subsequent to the festival month, you mm. see inventory drop. And we have seen that happening in previous years Absolutely. as well. So we okay. saw the previous month reporting a 9.9 .9 or thereabouts in terms of IIP and of course we were looking at a much softer growth but definitely the negative print was a surprise and uh, there were one or two factors that really led to the negative print. One was, uh, which was a negative surprise, was the capital goods production. Yes, the base does play a role, but over the last six months, we had seen a fair degree of a good momentum mm -hmm. uh, observed in the capital goods production. And also, this was corroborated by the CAPEX uh, led by the government mm. in terms of its uh, planned mm. spending. I think that was uh, uh, weaving in well. What really came as a much of a disappointment was this sudden momentum uh, drop Mm. was uh, being led by uh, some critical items within capital goods like electric machinery or rubber insulated uh, cables which of course are inherently volatile but the fact that these were doing well and mm. suddenly you saw a right. kind of a stop. So capital goods was a disappointment. Consumption goods broadly have been on a relatively weaker term particularly mm. non-durables but overall I think uh, you know 3.2 in a negative zone was not anticipated more towards a closer positive, a small right. positive. Okay. And, and I'll ask you about, I mean, what, sure. what lies ahead. But sure. Ajay, let me come back to you on the now on the inflation part. So, is that was that a surprise to you as well? Not really. I was expecting uh, around the same number. Hmm. So, uh, overall, we are seeing, uh, you know, inflation around the RBI's uh, trajectory. And I think that is where it is going to uh, persist in the, in the coming months. Uh, second thing, you know, the I think the uh, determining factor going ahead will mm. be fuel prices. Mm. How much of fuel price cut is passed on? Mm. Uh, if let's say it's it's only a larger portion is taken in by the government uh, by hiking excise duty, mm. then of course you know it does not have significant positive impact on inflation. Right. So why is that? You feel only fuel prices could be the uh, sort of a betting factor. Why not something else? See, because I think other things are uh, falling in line with expectation. Mm -hmm. So we have already seen that food prices have corrected, mm. uh, fuel inflation has fallen as much as, as it could in, in case of mm. WPI as well as CPI and even core inflation is much in control. Mm. So there is no worry on all these fronts. Mm. But incrementally the uh, positive effect can come from the fuel inflation. Right. In some ways that's beyond our control because that's really a factor of fuel prices either falling further or being passed on. Or, or I, I mean other factor is if, if government is taking in as excise duty hike or passing it on to the right. What, what about food inflation? Now that's risen somewhat worryingly as well. It is, but I think uh, you know, uh, going ahead, uh, uh, I don't see significant risk f on that front because mm -hmm. if you look at you know uh, the the more uh, volatile segments like vegetable, fruits, as well as for pulses, on a month on month basis, inflation has come off in mm -hmm. this month. Okay. So I'm not particularly worried about food inflation. Uh, okay. Let's say within this. And, and your comfort year. line is the Reserve Bank projection. So and obviously this is still exactly. roughly in that region. Exactly. Okay. Shubhita, the question we ask normally on this program: If you were to take a step back and look at the numbers over, let's say, an eight sure. to twelve month period, sure. what is this telling you? Well, I think uh, the headline message would be that uh, we are slightly disappointed at the pace of growth, mm -hmm. the pace of recovery, which we were actually penciling in a growth of about close to 7.5%, which was revised and mm -hmm. marked down earlier on. And this 7.5 is also looking at slight risk, not mm -hmm. a big risk, but a slight risk. Uh, as exports have shrunk very sharply, mm. uh, while we definitely knew that exports are not likely to grow, mm. uh, but the degree of contraction has been uh, uh, rather intense. 
Uh, also, the government-led CAPEX translating into headline numbers mm. is not yet forthcoming on a sustained basis for mm. a broad-based growth. And that is what is prompting us to mark down growth. So, mm. the first message would be a downside surprise on growth. Second, uh, while I agree with Anjali in part of fuel that how much of excise will translate, I get a bit worried about food inflation mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, this was the month where a large part of us were anticipating that while the food momentum uh, will be easing but uh, uh, you know this was not really forthcoming mm -hmm. uh, in fact items like cereals mm. when uh, like uh, wheat have mm. really gone up mm. vegetables and fruits have corrected to mm. a large extent as anticipated no, but temporary but, aberration or uh, that's exactly my outlook is that if we are seeing a warm winter mm. we will see some pressure on uh, production of cereals mm. so the pace of decline in food inflation that was being earlier anticipated may not be forthcoming Okay. And therefore, that is a point of worry. And, and that's you're saying is because of weather reasons? Uh, or that's climate change reasons. Okay. reasons. Mm. Uh, uh, having said, we still anticipate uh, mm. the broader, as Anjali was also pointing out, core inflation remains well within range. Uh, we are actually seeing a somewhat downside surprise on our uh, uh, inflation uh, versus what RBI is projecting at 5.8. We still see a small room of 40 basis point downside surprise mm -hmm. uh, for inflation in right. January. And uh, would that pave way for uh, monetary policy easing? To my mind, uh, it does open up a small room of 25. Which was perhaps point. not there or didn't look like uh, it was which there. Which didn't look, yeah. well, which was being waited and watched upon. Mm. Uh, but I think 25 basis points because this January would be a critical month because mm. 5.8 right. was one. Okay, so let me pick up on one point you mentioned, which is exports, right? So we've talked yeah. about some of the potential tailwinds, which are very yeah. small in the Indian context, which is domestic capex. Yes. But the global uh, economy is yes. still looking weak. And we've had the whole China blow up in the Absolutely. last three weeks. So what does that mean? Actually, China slowdown was not unanticipated. Mm. I think what has been uh, uh, making the markets a bit more nervous is is the policymakers' take on which way they want to go on a sustained basis, be it uh, mm. it's a currency management or how they are looking to revive the economy. Mm. I think these two factors are keeping the markets guessing. And we've had two bouts of, uh, uh, you know, the currency-led volatility in the financial markets. And I'm afraid this is likely to continue. Mm. So our early expectation that it would be a very gradual and uh, systematic devaluation may not really play out. So probably, uh, you know, we could see some of these spurts of volatility may persist. Uh, you know, in pockets of time right. going forward. Right. So, uh, Adli, what are you focusing on as the as the one or two numbers that would either give you comfort or discomfort in the next three months? I now it's the budget time, so we'll mm. be looking at fiscal deficit. Okay. Um, for this year, we are expecting that 3.9% uh, uh, that uh, government has budgeted mm. will be achieved mm. by doing a lot of things in the sense that I think uh, looking at the revenue collections that government has so far, they will have to, you know, continue to increase excise duty on petrol and diesel. Okay. And only, you so know, by doing that, they'll be able earlier. to, yeah, so yeah. it's a balancing act. Yeah, yeah. However, the crucial part will be, I mean, what they are uh, forecasting for FI17. Hmm. So we are expecting a slippage of about 40 to 50 basis points because government has, you know, ha has been expecting a 3.5% or mm -hmm. has been guiding a 3.5% for FI17. Uh, so we are expecting a slippage over there by about 40, 50 basis points, so 3.9%. Mm. And this is, of course, largely coming because of the, uh, you know, 7th pay commission. Okay. So fact. what what needs to be done then? If assuming, let's say, work has to be done on the fiscal deficit, work has to be done to rein in inflation further, and we have to do something to ensure that the economy is not fully exposed to the headwinds that we're seeing internationally. So see, I think uh, uh, one uh, expectation that I would have from the government is probably for the time being, allow the fiscal deficit to slip a little. Mm -hmm. Do not stay focused on fiscal consolidation path mm. because we are at a stage where, where uh, domestic economy is still not recovering as everybody was hoping for. Global slowdown, you know, st is still persisting. So I would expect that government should, you know, uh, allow fiscal deficit to slip in FI17 because they have got this obligation of uh, uh, seven pay commission. But that should not take, you know, uh, uh, that should not mean that capital spending takes a back seat. Mm -hmm. So they should, uh, you know, meet with this obligation of a seventh pay commission. Mm. 
Now, see, I would also see seventh pay commission as a stimulus for the timing. Sure, it's, sure. it's going to be a consumption stimulus. Hmm. Uh, I mean, as has been the case with fifth and sixth pay commission. Hmm. So, so that can be one stimulus which will come. Hmm. And second can be, you know, uh, the path on capital spending uh, stays as government has done in uh, this year as well. Okay. So, you're saying let fiscal deficit go a little bit. Yes. Because we need the funding to, I mean, get keep the oils, yeah. I mean, the machinery running. Yes, Shubhada. Well, what's your outlook? Uh, I think outlook is government needs to really look at uh, spurring the rural economy. Mm -hmm. Because at a time when we are not looking at any recovery in the global uh, economic mm. outlook uh, quickly, a quick turnaround, obviously the focus has to be domestic mm. uh, orientation. And in that, the consumption has been lagging behind, the rural consumption has been lagging behind. So we are looking for government's, uh, uh, you know, uh, incentives towards productive stimulus in the rural economy, be it on rural infrastructure. I mean, not going through the very easy route of just doling out money, but linking it to productive activity activities essentially domiciled in the rural economy and that is something that the government will really need to work hard mm. on and uh, as far as the budget arithmetic is concerned I really wish the government had stepped up its disinvestment uh, process mm. early on in the year gone by or year that we are in because that time the, the first quarter the markets were good uh, there was a significant and decent lineup of uh, you know dilution mm. of companies that government was looking to do but somehow government slipped on in terms of starting the process. Mm. As a result, we have a huge shortfall. Mm. This time, I hope the disinvestment targets are slightly more realistic and the government starts early on. Mm. We of course have... Uh, and you know, this you're saying is largely option. because we need more money in the kitty we to do the things money. we want to do. Absolutely, okay, yeah. because uh, you know we cannot expect uh, 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 you know global savings to come uh, rushing in mm. unless and until your policies are really stepping up in mm. terms of either a GST happening. I mean, GST of course is a more a long-term play. Mm. But the fact is it provides a signal that this government is able to, you know, mm. uh, introduce reforms right. even in challenging times. Right. Okay. Uh, Anjali, last word. I mean, do you have a, way, a sort of one expectation from the budget? From the budget is only hoping that they, you know, uh, stay focused on capital spending. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what, last word? I, I would think a small bit of relaxation on fiscal consolidation can be considered mm. as long as it's the uh, productive spending that government focuses on. Well, we've run out of time completely. Coming up on Policy Watch next, Startup India. What does the government need to do and can do to nurture India's vibrant startup ecosystem? Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Policy Watch. The government has launched an ambitious Startup India exercise to foster the entrepreneur and innovation ecosystem in the country. The hope is that life will become simpler for young entrepreneurs brimming with ideas on starting up new businesses. The government is also setting up a 2000 crore India Aspiration Fund, which will be managed by the Small Industries Development Bank of India, or SIDBI, to promote and finance small enterprises. Now, the government's move will obviously help the booming startup ecosystem in India and help create jobs and growth. But what more needs to be done to ensure that young entrepreneurs are truly liberated and are able to succeed and fail as sometimes markets want them to? What more can be done in terms of infrastructure to ensure digitally enabled businesses can reach their full potential? Well, to discuss all of this, I'm joined by two early investors and votaries of India's startup ecosystem, Mahesh Murthy, co-founder of Seed Fund, and Praveen Chakravarti, co-founder of Mumbai Angels, India's first angel investing network. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Praveen, let me begin with you. So, this is unusual for India. I mean, the government actually going and wading into this space and trying to do something literally from the front foot. Where could this go? When I first heard of in the government of India's startup initiative, I was reminded of that quip in the... Um, uh, late 90s when uh, Indians were winning Miss World and Miss Universe titles and Indian IT companies were doing very well and the quip then was the India is doing very well globally in IT and mm. beauty because mm. the government doesn't know either. Mm. Today the fact is that there is a booming thriving mm. startup ecosystem. Mm. The numbers are very clear and evident. Mm. There's seven billion dollars that has come in in 2015 just in startups. Mm. To put that in context, that's more than FII investment in our stock markets. Mm -hmm. For the first time Foreign in history. portfolio investment in our markets, yeah. Mm. For the first time in history. Mm. So with that as a background, mm. admitting that there is a thriving ecosystem already, mm. what can the government do now mm. so as to foster this further, but mm. more importantly, mm. not to disrupt it, mm -hmm. to use the innovation lingo. Okay. So from my perspective, I think uh, in terms of, if I just lay out some of the broad uh, um, uh, frameworks, intellectual property and intellectual intellectual property rights mm. 
neutrality of the internet and a bit about skilled labor are the three broad areas where I think the government can indeed help. Okay. Leaving aside the ease of business, which I think applies to all of businesses. Everyone, yeah, right. And that's something that we are hoping that things will move faster. Mahesh? So, I, you know, uh, when people talk about startups go in, I mean, they tend to think of the glamorous startups which are funded by venture capitalists and, you know, uh, which have you know, X million dollars of funding announced in some pages of a newspaper. I want to talk about two different parts of it. Yes, we'll talk about the more glamorous startups, but my point is really for every one glamorous startup, there are 100 non-glamorous startups, mm -hmm. which is a housewife who wants to start a florist business, somebody who wants to start a little consulting company, somebody who wants to start a little engineering company. Now, the big issue, let's start with the unglamorous parts first. Traditionally in India, our banking system has only managed to back people who can offer collateral. So hence, if you start a garment factory against the particular garments mm -hmm. that you have, you can, you, can, you can do that. But now we are in the information economy. We, we need working capital financing. We need the ability to finance salaries and, and, and uh, operation expenses. Typically, banks don't fund OPEX, mm -hmm. and hence people don't start companies. My one issue out there is an ability. I, I'm not talking about the government putting money. Mm -hmm. You talked about the 2,000 crores of SIDBI. Well, if you can make the 200,000 crores, and for example, all you've got to do is give the banks the mm. ability to fund a startup where you guarantee the first one crore of collateral, like mm. the CGT SME scheme does, and start 200,000 such companies and not mm. 2,000. 2,000 is there, has been there for 10 years. It's mm. nothing new out here. Mm. I think that's the first one. The, the second issue out here on the glamorous side is, is really interesting that even all these glamorous startups, whether it's the flip cards or the red buses or the uh, make my trips of the world, the real big shame is they've all been funded by foreign money. Mm. None of us own any equity in these companies which are going to be our, our big success of the future. Because we don't want to or we can't? Or no, because we can't. Okay. Because all the money that's gone into the venture capital funds mm. is overseas money. Mm. And even though we have a lot of money in our country, in the LICs, in the insurance companies, in the banks, we haven't allowed our banks and our insurance companies to invest a part of their corpus mm. in actually the early stage sector. Mm. It's strange to understand that the largest shareholder mm. in ITC, the cigarette company, mm. is LIC, mm. right? Mm. When you can fund, you know, mm. a merchant of debt, you can actually fund a startup. Mm. So my, my two requests here uh, for policy changes are one, allow Indian financial institutions mm. to take a small part, maybe 1%, 2%, 5%. Yeah, because the no obvious question would be, what is the kind of risk appetite that we're looking what at? So you, the, you do yeah. your asset allocation and say, mm. fine, of all my investable assets, you put some in land and in stock market, but maybe a 1% or whatever. Mm. And then you put that into a center of Indian venture funds so that mm. you have Indian money going back into Indian venture funds. Mm. Why is it only that the only people who will benefit from all the hot stars in the Indian ecosystem are overseas fund managers? Silicon Valley. Praveen, do you agree with this proposition? Uh, agree and disagree. Okay. Um, agree that foreign capital and when uh, Mahesh talks about glamour, I think that's equivalent to foreign funding mm. essentially. Mm. Foreign capital tends to go into business models that have that have been known and proven in the US and that's why you find mm. that e-commerce and the Olas mm. get getting more. So to, to that extent there's you know mm. we, do, we do need absolute domestic capital. Mm. But we must remember that the broader macro environment is we do not have our pension funds still investing in stock markets. Mm. It's for the first year in 2015 that mm. EPFO funds mm. were allowed to be invested in index funds. Mm. With some trepidation. With mm. some trepidation. Mm. A lot of trepidation. Mm. Given this kind of a risk appetite and mm. given where we are in our um, uh, overall development, mm. there will be questions asked mm. about putting taxpayer money in risky asset classes. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with Mahesh, it can be done smartly. Mm -hmm. but Which is through an LIC or through? Or through through, through uh, 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 default first, right. first loss default guarantee mm. type uh, models, mm. through various uh, credit mechanisms. Mm. There could be various ways to do that. Mm. Certainly not the India Aspiration Fund, which in my uh, view aims to take taxpayer money put it in risky venture capital funds, mm. which are anyway getting funds mm. from foreign investors mm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So these are not funds that are going to be investing in social sectors where private capital may not go. Right. Private so capital may when not you go. say 2,000 crore should go to 200,000 crore, which is a good target or a good scalable target, where should that money come from? So actually, here's, here's the thing, right? So that money is actually out there in cycling. First mm. of all, this 2,000 crores is not you. Mm. SIDBI has been doing it for 10 right, years, right, right? right? So all one is in, and the, the way it works is very straightforward. Essentially, the nationalized banks of India, a dozen of them, are being have, should be told that you have now have a mandate to fund a startup mm. without collateral for mm. the first one crore, mm. and we will back you up mm. at the back end. Either we will fund it, or more intelligently, we will mm. insure it. Mm. So you put it out there, maybe 10% fail, uh, we've got insurance coverage and that'll, that'll pay out. So mm. essentially, if you do this well, even if you take, say, 20,000 crores, you can fund 200,000 startups to a tune of one crore right. each, right? right? Collateral free. Right. So essentially, the, wherever the money comes from, I'm saying, 
you know, if the government is ready to uh, promise 125,000 crores to Bihar and didn't do it, I mean, there must be some money somewhere. And if you are serious about this stand up India and start up India, my only, my only point here was why are you only focusing okay. on, on this quote unquote glamorous VC funded, outside funded businesses? Mm. So actually fund the businesses that nobody else would touch, which really will create the, you know, the, the brunt of the employment. The big change that you see out here compared, uh, going compared to 10, 15 years ago is the earlier government used to believe that the way to develop India is to make the big family houses bigger, mm. to give more, you know, land and grants to the Adanis and the Ambanis and the Tatas and the Birlas. And now I think this government has realized that the only way to get development is not to make the rich richer, mm. but to allow small enterprises to bloom. Okay. And for that to I happen... I think that's a conceptually good thing. Okay, so let me, let me, let's move on. So we've talked about the financing. What else are we looking at? What, what else do we need to do to ensure that all these enterprises, small, big, digital, non-digital, actually flourish? So a couple of things. One, I'll, I'll take a, a, a point that Prime Minister and take it forward. One is a simple idea of better availability of, of broadband across India with complete net neutrality. I mean, don't do this Facebook free basic stuff in the Airtel mm -hmm. Zero stuff, right? That's one. The second thing is really the ability for people to fail. Mm -hmm. Right now, it takes you four weeks to start a company, but seven years to shut a company down. So it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a big weight on your shoulders when you have to go through enormous numbers of audits and so on and so forth. Just make it easy. Just allow one form to form a, start a company and say, okay, it's over, it's done. Take the stigma of failure away from you. Mm -hmm. You know, stop insisting for everything that I, you know, I need your houses, give me as collateral and so on and so forth. Mm. Just make it easy for people to get money in and mm. get money out so that people understand that there is a value out here. And that in some ways may also address the social part of it. I mean, the, the, the social yeah. sort of cost of failure, so to speak. Yeah, as well as celebrate failure. I mean, mm. I mean why, right. there's nothing wrong with celebrating failure. It's mm. okay. Not mm. every startup will be successful. It's fine. As long as you manage it well and you, you have you've covered mm. just make sure the money goes and make it easy without social stigma without you know being in tax jail and so on and so forth for seven years for people to say it didn't work out let's stop it let's start something else okay so ease of exit ease of exit and broadband are two Praveen you want to add to the list of non-finance sure um, you know one is of course um, what I talked about touched upon is intellectual property rights mm. and I do I have met many 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 startups mm. where today I don't know if we are aware that there are intellectual property offices IP offices only in the four metros we mm. still live in the concept of metros mm. we all know that the the so-called Silicon Valley of, of India which is Bangalore mm. does not have an intellectual property patent office mm -hmm. so let's start by recognizing that IP is important we need to make it easy and that that is important so mm. i think that a very small tweak can be done easily and sends a strong signal mm. for entrepreneurs to develop ip based uh, uh, businesses mm -hmm. um, then the, there is an issue of uh, um, uh, labor semi skilled mm. and unskilled mm -hmm. let's not forget for all the engineers that create apps mm. there are 500 delivery boys or taxi drivers or others that it actually generates jobs for mm. and to that extent it's extremely useful and important role that these uh, no, startups play but they all have a problem in getting semi-skilled labor mm. on one hand we have a separate in a silo called skill india mm. On the other hand, if you talk to any of these unglamorous startups, as Mahesh referred to, be it in uh, logistics, housekeeping, they all tell you the same thing. They cannot get skilled labor, semi-skilled labor. Mm -hmm. So there is a need to synchronize some of these initiatives. Yes, these, this is not exactly the glamorous uh, policy work uh, that wonks would like to see, mm -hmm. but this is very, very important in my view in trying to ease uh, mm -hmm. operations. The, all of this other than the overall ease of doing business, which I don't think is uh, separate for people, uh, youngsters clad in jeans starting mm. startups or uh, somebody in Surat uh, starting a trading house. It mm. should be easy for all of them. Okay. I have one more point. Mm. Uh, and this is interesting. I mean, the Indian government and uh, uh, both at the central level and at the state levels has a significant amount of outlay of spend every year, mm. whether it's on defense or it's on healthcare and so on and so forth. Uh, would it be possible to say, you know, set aside 5% of that for SMEs, mm. right? Mm. So those are the spends that the TCS and, the, and you know, and, mm. and, and the Infosys cannot bid for, mm. right? So it's like... I mean, defense is in any case a sort of a source of so much innovation, funding uh, and, yeah, and partnerships. So, but set aside... Yeah, so or potentially can be. Yeah, but yeah. Going, the thing is, you know, you try to enter that. Immediately you say that, you know, as part of the tender notice, you have to show, mm. you know, a three-year balance sheet with a minimum net yeah. worth of 100 crores. Mm. Then, you know, the point is that you want to be able to say, set aside, say, it's not, say, not just defense, whether it's in any sector, mm. education, the government spends a huge amount of money in education, healthcare, defense mm. services. Mm. Set aside a small part, a 5% part, 10% part for the SMEs, mm. right? I'm saying even other than government money, we just mandated corporates to do 2% CSR. Mm. Allow that for R&D mm. spend in mm. public universities if mm. you want. Mm. 
right. make that CSR compliant. Right. So can I get just one last line from both of you? So Mahesh, one thing that you would look forward to as we go into this new phase of government private partnerships and right. new So A, I'm really happy that the government has come to the point of view that innovation has got to start not by making the big guys sure. bigger, but making the small guys bigger. Two, I really believe for this to happen, India has to participate more, real India has to participate more, Bharat has to participate more. And for this, the two points I really have are again, I'll come back to it, getting Indian money hmm. into Indian startups as opposed to foreign money into Indian startups. And second, more importantly, allowing banks to offer collateral free loans to a much wider number of people. Right. So far, only 1,200,000 crore is the figure. Yeah. That's a good one. Gentlemen, we've run out of time completely. That's all we have time for on Policy Watch this week. We'll be back next week, same time. Thanks for watching.